Current electricity is defined as a continuous flow of electrons in an electrical path. There are two different ways of representing this, first as a pictorial diagram and next as a schematic diagram. Schematic diagrams are very clean representations of an electrical circuit. It's easy to photocopy and easy to uh, read. So that's why we prefer that as a standard. But as an introduction, I'm just going to show you the pictorial representation as well. So here we have a source, the energy source. The energy source will be consumed by something known as a load. When you connect these together, in real life, if you're using regular wires, yes, they're all loosey-goosey and it's a big fat mess. But we want to keep things nice and tidy in a schematic representation. So you'll pull out a ruler and draw either perfectly horizontal or perfectly vertical lines. Normally, you don't hook up circuits like this. We usually have something that interrupts the flow of current, known as a, excellent, as a switch. And now we can hook up the entire circuit. In the current state, the light bulb will not light up because the switch is opened. There's not a complete loop for the electrons to flow through. You need to close the switch in order for electricity to flow. Here's the next common misconception. How fast do electrons flow in the circuit? Do they flow as quickly as the picture that you see over here? Do they flow a lot faster? Or do they flow a whole lot slower? And this is the weird part. In fact, they do flow a whole lot slower in real life. And you might be wondering, well, why is it that when I flip on a light switch, the light turns on immediately? Yes, the signal travels at the speed of light, but the electrons don't. As you may know from junior grades, electrons don't like other electrons. So the moment you shuffle one electron to one side, the electron almost instantaneously will want to run away. And that's what's really happening in an electrical circuit. It's really the energy that's being transmitted at the speed of light. Meanwhile, the electrons are only traveling a couple of centimeters per second. Bit more definitions. When you have an individual battery, technically it's known as a cell. And when you have a bunch of cells connected together, that's when you have something known as a battery. As for a schematic representation, this represents a single cell. And if you have a battery of cells, which is where the term really comes from, then you have multiple of them connected together. Normally, schematic diagrams look like this and you'll have to interpret which side is positive and which side is negative. And the general rule is that the longer lead is the positive side and the shorter lead is the negative side of the circuit. And here's another interesting thing. With regards to the nine volt, it actually is a battery. If you ever have a chance to dissect it, you'll notice it's actually comprised of multiple tiny little cells inside. Six of them specifically, each one at 1.5 volts. The math does work out. Here's a classic representation of the difference between voltage and current. We often represent it with Niagara Falls, where the width of Niagara Falls describes the quantity of water that's falling or the quantity of electrons that are flowing. In other words, the width represents the current. And the voltage is how much energy there is per droplet of water. And if you think about it from the perspective of gravity, if it drops very small, then there isn't much energy per electron. Meanwhile, if it drops a lot, there's a lot of energy associated with that individual electron. So the height of Niagara Falls represents the voltage. And here's the thing. I know this is a perspective drawing, but if you look at it straight on, you'll observe that there's a rectangle. And with all rectangles, you can measure the surface area. And the surface area does have meaning here. Whenever you multiply the voltage by the current, in grade 9 you might have learned that it gives you the corresponding, excellent, the corresponding power. You could think about voltage as the intensity of the sting. For example, if you have, uh, let's say, a, a little penny and it drops in your head only a few inches above, you don't feel much at all. Meanwhile, if you raise it up high enough, it's going to hurt when it hits you. And that's how voltage is. The greater the voltage, the greater the sting. But what will really kill you is not the voltage, it's actually the current flow that flows through your body. Now, as our bodies have a relatively high res resistivity, somewhere around 100 ohms, 100,000 ohms or higher, um, you'll need to have a fairly high voltage before you can cause your heart to stop beating. And I think we're going to do a math calculation based upon that.
With regards to this unit here, there are tons and tons of derived units. Once again, there's only seven fundamental units that we have. Uh, of all seven, we only use five in high school. The memory for that is MKS for meters, kilograms, seconds. And the other two is current in amperes and temperature measured in Kelvin. And that's all we use in high school physics. With these fundamental units, we can derive out all these other units. We'll start off with work and energy. We know that work and energy can be measured in joules. Now work is, just, is written down as the letter W and energy is written down as the letter capital E. Here's another interesting thing. Even though James Joule is a proper name, if you're ever describing it as a unit or as a measurement, you don't capitalize it. But for the unit symbol, yes, you do capitalize that because if you write down little j, that actually means a certain dimension, the imaginary one. So as for work and energy, joules is not a fundamental unit, but a joule is also equal to a Newton times meter and a Newton is equal to a kilogram times a meter per second squared. So kilogram times a meter per second squared times another meter will give you kilograms times meter squared over second squared. Do it enough times and you'll memorize it just like me. Time, oh, I erased it. Time cannot be broken down any further. Time is, an, is the smallest base unit. Yes, you could break down a second down to a millisecond, but it's still a measurement of seconds. It's just a fraction of it. You can't represent any other units to, to describe a second. And that's what a base unit is. So seconds cannot be broken down any further and described by another unit. Meanwhile, on the other hand, a joule can be described by a Newton times meter, for example. Potential difference, often known as voltage, is defined by a capital V. And in some university textbooks, they'll call it an EMF or an electromotive force, something to push the electrons so that they'll move through a circuit. This is one of the very few times in physics where it makes sense, where the variable and the unit measure are the same letter. It would have been nice if everything else was like that. Now you'll notice that V is not part of the M K S A capital K system. And that's because a volt is not a fundamental unit. A volt can be represented by a joule per coulomb and a joule is equal to a Newton times meter. And a coulomb interestingly is not a fundamental unit. So when you go through all the math, it does look something ugly like that. Are you expected to prove that to me on a test? Not in grade 11, but I'm just letting you know a volt can be broken down further. On the other hand, with regards to current measured in amperes, that is a fundamental unit. Here's the interesting thing. Current's variable is the letter I. The unit symbol is the letter A. So why the letter I? Well, if you take a look back into grade uh, grade nine, there is a particular page in there where there's some tiny text right here that explains it to you. The symbol I is used for current because it stands for intensity. Now you know. Thanks, grade nine science. So current is a fundamental unit, even though by definition, current is how many coulombs of electrons flow per second. Why this weird thing? We'll have to talk about that later on because we'll need the entire unit before we can explain why that's true. Resistance is the opposition to current flow. You might have learned that. The variable for that is the letter R. The unit symbol for that is, good, the horseshoe, omega. An ohm is also equal to a volt divided by an amp. So if you take these two and you divide them by the, each other, you end up getting that as the fundamental units. Power is the rate that work is being accomplished. It can also be used in electricity as well. Power, just like in the previous unit, is measured in watts. As for the fundamental units for power, if power is equal to a joule per second, or one watt is equal to a joule per second, that's equal to one Newton per meter over a second, or all of the stuff over here per another second. So second squared divided by another second will give you seconds cubed, and that's what it is for power. Lastly, we, we talked about this briefly before. C is Coulomb. You can think about it as a very huge number, kind of like a mile. A Coulomb is a large quantity of electrons. 
6.24 times 10 to the 18 electrons specifically. That's a lot of them. And since it's impossible for us to count that many in a given second, we don't tr treat charge as a fundamental unit. I do have an excellent playlist on fundamental units if you have a chance to watch it. As for the conventions of current flow, there are two of them that existed. Back almost 400 years ago, there was a crazy man who decided to fly kite in the middle of a rainstorm. You might know who he is. Good old Benjamin Franklin. This is often known as conventional current. This is the way that has been done for uh, over 300 years by now. Uh, where they, where be, due to his experiment that he conducted, he just had to make an assumption. And he didn't know whether current flowed from positive to negative or from negative to positive. He took his chances and said, eh, let's say that electricity flows from positive to negative. So current leaves from the positive lead of a battery, travels through the circuit, and returns back to the negative portion of that battery or cell. We're going to actually use this convention for the rest of this unit. Even though it's been proven wrong, we just want to keep it to the same standard because if enough people do it incorrectly, eventually all wrongs become right. All right, because it wasn't until about 150 years ago that there was another person who challenged this and said, you know what, protons can't move because if a proton defines the element, if you take away a proton, that element has turned into a new one. It's downgraded on the periodic table, meaning that if you pass electricity through a copper wire, it doesn't become copper anymore. And that's not the case, because if you ever pass electricity through a wire, you notice it doesn't suddenly change colors. So that can't be true. Instead, it must be the electrons that flow through a circuit. So now we have the revised version where you say it's the electrons uh, around the valence shell of that particular atom that move through a circuit. So they leave from the negative and flow through to the positive. So which one is correct then? in real life. Well, here's an argument to say that they're both actually fine and dandy. Let's say that we decide to take a piece of this wire over here, and here is a visual representation of it. All the little circles represent the gaps so the electrons can flow through the circuit. These are the empty spaces in the valence shell of that conductor. Let's populate it up with electrons. In this particular circuit here, you'll notice at the top, the electrons are going to be flowing towards the left. So let's animate that out. But you'll also notice another optical illusion. As the electrons flow to the left, you'll notice that that little bubble or that little gap space is moving to the right. And that's how we argue that current flow is a thing. We just don't take a look at the electrons anymore. We look at the gap that flows in the opposite direction. If you ever looked in a, an aquarium before with the aerator, you'll notice that as the bubbles move up, what's really happening is that the water is falling downwards filling up that space. And you, as an optical illusion, you see the bubbles going up. That's effectively where we're trying to argue here. One more thing before we move on, and it's that there are two different ways of transmitting electricity. We can either allow current to flow in just one direction only, all day long, and that's known as direct current flow. On the other hand, if we want the current to flow one way, stop, flow the opposite way, stop, go this way, stop, go that way, and just keep on going back and forth, back and forth, then that's known as alternating current. And it seems rather awkward. Why would someone want the electricity to stop and go the opposite way? Well, yet again, it's going to take the entire unit to explain why this is true. So hold on tight, kids. Just for a timeline, uh, so that we can better appreciate what's going on here, everything right up until around just before the 1900s, we assumed that electricity flowed from positive to negative. And it wasn't until an interesting experiment that was conducted right at the turn of the century where they said, you know what, it's actually electrons are flowing the other way. But you may have heard of these famous people before. All these people here assumed that electricity flowed from positive to negative, and there are famous equations based upon that assumption. So because there were hundreds of years of research assuming that electricity flowed from positive to negative, it's kind of tough to say that because somebody decided to say that things are different now for everyone to adjust and switch over to the new way of life. So that's why in high school textbooks, we don't bother with the new age way of thinking. We still stick with the traditional way uh, as we need to stick with one standard. Because one of the problems is that if one pe group of people argue one way, 
any other group of people argue the other way, then you're going to have different answers depending upon which group is observing the events. And we can't have that in science. We need to have the same consistent results. So that's why we'll stick with conventional current throughout the entire unit. Let's go through some old formula and some new formula as well. You might be familiar with this one, V equals IR and P equals IV. That you should have learned from back in grade nine. Something new that we just mentioned today are these two equations over here. For example, what exactly is a volt? If you looked up on the table earlier, a volt by definition is how much energy there is per packet of electrons. That's why the formula for a volt is E over Q. Current, if you want to think about it as, as a definition, it's how many electrons are flowing in per second. So it's a quantity of electrons measured in coulombs over time. Power, by definition, is equal to I times V. And I don't know if you ever thought about this back in grade 9. Why is it that W is equal to A times V? Why is it? Is it because A is a, is a number 1 and V is a number of whatever it is? And whatever that number is, plus 1, gives you the next letter in the alphabet? Well, that can't be the case. Why is it that A times V give you W? In grade 9, you wouldn't have known the answer. But I hope that you'll figure that out by now. And it's because an ampere is defined also as how many coulombs of electrons that flow per given second. And a volt is how much energy there is per packet of electrons. Since you're multiplying them, you'll see that there's a coulomb in the numerator and a coulomb in the denominator. They divide each other out, and all you're left with is a joule per second. Isn't that the definition of what a watt is? And now you know. Another review for back grade nine, total energy consumption is equal to power times time. This is a new one for us all, uh, unless you've taken chemistry all, uh, already. With regards to an electron, there is a fundamental charge for it. That was the experiment that was conducted by Robert Millikan, right over here. He was trying to determine the charge of one lonely electron. And we'll talk more about that story in grade 12 physics. But what he concluded is that if an electron can be broken down any further, then the electron is the elementary charge. So in other words, if you have one electron, then you have this number over here, 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And if you have two electrons in that atom, then you should logically have two of the double this value. So 3.204 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Or if you had three electrons, then 4.806 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Or if you had four valence electrons, and I think you get the idea here. That it creates a very consistent pattern, but there are gaps. In other words, if this was a physical number line, a number exists here. The next number exists over here. Could there ever be a number between these two? If you can't have a fraction of electron, then it's impossible to have 2 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. That number can exist. And this is pretty much the beginning of something known as quantum uh, mechanics, which is the idea that you can only have a number here, and you can only have a number here. You can't have anything between, so everything has to be quantized. In other words, it's either packaged here over here or packaged down over here. Let's go through a math example that doesn't really involve uh, the word quantum <laughs> what is the potential difference of a cell that delivers one joule of energy for every 4.16 times 10 to the 18 electrons? We'll start off with our givens. We have energy and we have N for number of electrons. We know that we're trying to solve for potential difference. So V is equal to E over Q. We have E, but we don't have Q yet. However, we do know that Q is equal to N times E. If we have this many electrons and each electron has this quantity of charge, then if you multiply them together, you should be able to figure out the total charge. So E and Q will be replaced with N times E. So your voltage is equal to 1.00 joules divided by 4.16 times 10 to the 18 electrons, and each electron has a charge of 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Going through all that math, you'll have a measurement 
in joules per coulomb, which is the definition of what a volt is. If a solar cell can provide 912 joules of energy per minute and can produce a steady current of 1.25 amperes, can the cell power up a car cell phone charger? What is the wattage rating of that solar cell? So we're curious to see if these numbers over here can give you 12 volts. Let's check that out. The value for E we have, however, the value of Q we don't have yet. But Q is also equal to I delta T, right? I is equal to Q over T, if you rewind back. So therefore, I is equal to Q over delta T, or Q is equal to I times delta T. So you have E over I times delta T. So 912 joules over 1.25 amperes, which by definition is a coulomb per second, times 60 seconds. You'll see the seconds divide each other out, and you get an answer that will be measured in joules per coulomb, which is the definition of a volt. After some brief number crunching, you find out that this value here is greater than 12 volts, so yes, it's sufficient to power up a car cell phone charger. What is the corresponding wattage rating of this? Well, we know that power is equal to uh, current times voltage. So with a current of 1.25 amperes multiplied by 12.2 volts, this will work out to, I believe, 15 watts. That's one way of answering it. But there's also another way that which avoids us from doing all these calculations here. Remember that by definition, power is equal to the rate of energy usage. So that could be also be calculated out by E over delta T. So 912 joules over 60 seconds. Go ahead and calculate that out. And you'll see that the answer there is exactly the same as the answer here. For more fun adventures of, like this, go through your homework. And I'll catch you in the next episode.